Good afternoon, thanks. So I'm going to talk to you about the use of 2D cellular automata. And it's really as a model for understanding leaching of corrosion inhibitors from primer coatings. If you see the QR code there, if you see the QR code, you can actually go and run the program while I'm talking. I don't know if you can pick the QR codes up with your phone from here. Probably not. But I'll move it on quickly if we get a chance. But no, you can have a look later. Or github.com slash steps39. Steps39. Okay. Right. Get the acknowledgements in first. I mean, this is work come out of my day job. It's sort of a hobby in a way. Um, really building on what we've worked for lots of people over the modelling side. All of the work we've done around the corrosion um, in our collaboration between Axtervale University of Manchester. Um, some funding from the European Union that helped to fund a 3D model. Um, and then what I've discovered is there's an awful lot of software out there that's great starting points. So you can build on top of other people's good ideas and twist those slightly to do what you want to do. They might have been wanting to write a computer game. You can use it to try and understand what's happening inside a real system. Uh, and recently we've had some um, MSc students of Philosophistines who've been able to actually run the program and been using it and give us some better ideas about what insights it's giving us. Okay. Um, so I'm going to tell you about corrosion and organic coatings. I realized starting this early that, you know, that hasn't been mentioned. I'll go through that relatively quickly. Um, tell you about why I'm doing it. Cellular automata some of the insights we've got, talk about limitations, and then just highlight the program itself. Um, so how do you stop corrosion with, with coatings? There are really two ways. What I'm going to focus on today is active methods. But firstly, we've got to understand there are a number of reactions happening. This is, I mean, talking to a corrosion audience, as a physical chemist, this is really dangerous. So please don't pick on this. But I felt I should at least put this up. So, OK, we've got active ways. We're basically going to change the surface. So we've put our coating down on the right-hand side there. You can see our coating, and something's going to come out of here that's going to interfere with the, the metal surface. So we've no longer got the metal surface there, and we can equally you know, do something constructive on the cathodic side to stop, sorry, to um, stop the corrosion, um, absorb the corrosion inhibitor to stop um, species coming along and either having the metal surface in the right way to interact with or stop species coming along there and corroding with it. The classic way that people think about um, a corrosion coating is just as a passive layer. So you put it across the whole surface, and then the idea is it's going to stop oxygen, it's going to stop water, um, which is a bit questionable because basically most, what I'm talking about here is now organic coatings, water and, and oxygen will get through that coating. So it's not probably doing that in the case of an organic coating. In the case of a ceramic coating, it may be different. Uh, but here we're probably going to at least impede the transport of ions if we don't entirely stop them. I'm probably not going to concentrate on the passive side of coating. I'm going to talk about the active protection. Um, once again, just going back to what a coating is, in my case, I'm talking about what many people think of being a paint. We have an organic binder that's going to hold the thing, whole thing together. That's typically in a, a solvent or it's in, a, in water and you've dispersed particles and that's carrying your system so you can actually paint it or spray it. Um, and then you've got fillers inside that do useful things. So in the case of your car, they make it look metallic and, and interesting and they stop the corrosion at the same time. Um, and then we've got additives to allow us to actually get the right surface cleaning we want, to be able to coat the surface and so on. So that's a paint. Um, what it really looks like is often very complicated. We have our metal here. We have the primer layer, and that's really where I'm concentrating because that's the bit we'll put the active components in to then protect the metal surface. Uh, but often you know, below that primer, there will be a surface pretreatment. There will have been some surface preparation done for metal. All those have an effect on the corrosion protection you get. On top of that, we often have an interlayer. Um, we can then have other coatings on top of there that give us the top coat. So that's your shiny metallic coat on the outside of the car. So what I'm talking about is really simplified in many ways. I'm focusing on this bit. For a coating to work, just like any system, for it not to corrode, the whole system has to work. So if you use the wrong metal, you're likely to have corrosion problems. If you put the wrong coating on the right metal, you might well have corrosion problems. So I'm just focusing on that primer layer. Um, looking at the thing in a bit more detail, here we've got our primer coating. Um, we've got a top coat on top of it. We won't take too much notice of that. Inside that, we've got various particles. Uh, over time, basically, uh, I've scribed this. I've had a scratch. Somebody's gone into the side of my car and scratched it. I've exposed the bare metal. Um, I will start to get corrosion happening there. What we hope to happen is what not um, is shown here is we hope not to have big piles of rust building up. 
but we're expecting that particles inside here, as Beatrice was describing as the ceramic materials, in her case they were coming out of the inhibit the in out of the nanotubes, the halide nanotubes. In my case their particles are dissolving and those are going to hopefully get to our surface and stop the corrosion from happening. And that's what I'm interested in simulating, because it's the rate at which those materials release and how they release that will determine the corrosion protection. So Reza Rimad, who's going to talk next in his PhD, measured quite a complicated corrosion inhibitor. Um, and here we're showing the effect of um, SP5 is basically 5% content, 10%, 20%, 40% of the release of different ions. And as you can see, the behavior is different between these different ions. Um, and, you know, as you'd sort of expect, first thing, basically, as you put more in, you get more released. But it's this that's going to determine if material is available. Uh, because once this material, this cumulative level stops dropping and there's not material coming out, you won't protect against corrosion. So if all the material leaked out very quickly, um, as shown in this first part here, and there was nothing then plateaued, you'd have no further corrosion protection. Equally, if you've got, got enough material, as you have down here, it may leach very, very slowly, but there's not a critical level that won't stop corrosion. So we've, we've simulated this in inverted commas, I'd say properly, um, in a 3D sense. So here you can see basically we have a coating here. This is the top of it, and that's water on top, looking a bit grey rather than blue. Um, as the um, water flows down through it, we're getting dissolution. So I put some axes in, some cross sections in here, a cross section across there, a cross section across there, and then a, a, pl a planar cross section. So if I just go back again on that, um, and it starts again. Yes, um, you can see the water's basically dissolving the inhibitor. So that's what's happening. Now, what you can see here is these particles just disappear almost because you can't see the connectivity in three dimensions. What's really happening is there's a pathway from one particle to another. So one particle dissolves, that was on the surface, that's connected to another particle of inhibitor which will dissolve after it. And that's what we can pick up in this 3D simulation. Um, these sort of simulations we've, we've done, and Eugenio Bonetti, as part of his PhD, did this using the, the cluster at Manchester, taking a week to do a computation. Um, and that isn't something we could do on the desktop, which gets me for the sort of motivation for doing this, that, you know, we've basically looked at this using very expensive kit with, with Reza here, and other teams, uh, for example, CSIRO in Australia have used X-ray uh, computer tomography as well, um, to look at the loss of pigment from these pores. So we believe that's what's happening. Eugenio has simulated it, and he's managed to show that we get the same sort of uh, behavior in terms of leaching um, that um, we see experimentally. And that's giving us an idea of how we can tune the properties to be even better. And that's something we can do with a computer code. I came across somebody who'd written a really nice little JavaScript 2D library that he was using basically well, one of the simulations he showed was water going through a cave system. So he used the cellular automata to generate a 2D cave. He put water in that cave, and you could see the water flowing down through the cave. So basically, he set up a rule that said it did that. So that looked to me a bit like a, co a coating. So that's sort of what got me interested in this. And, you know, the point is this can run on somebody's – this can run on your mobile phone. It can run on your computer, and it can run on anybody's browser. It doesn't need a compute facility to do it. There is a catch there, of course. This is flat land, not real 3D land. So things like connectivity, whereas, as you saw with those sections, there were particles that just seemed to disappear. In my 2D things, things won't disappear unless they're connected. And they've got to be connected in that one plane. So look at this. This is really why I said insights. We're trying to get some insights. And also we think things like education, this is quite a good way to give people very easily an idea of what's happening. In 3D, it's very complicated to see how things connect. Um, status, the, the course code is available open source. Um, we've implemented, well, I, I've implemented rules around um, inhibitors, around the inert polymer itself, and I'll come back to those. Water with a dissolved um, inhibitor in it has to diffuse, otherwise basically the system will never get anywhere out to protect anything. We're able to have multiple inhibitors in there. We're able to have dual layers, so we can simulate a stratified coating or a top coat with something happening in it and a, a primer coating. Um, the, the, the way in which we build the uh, coating itself, because it's all very well saying I'm going to have these things flowing, I've got to build the coating, so I'm doing that by two mechanisms. One is particle packing, 
and the other one is pure plagiarism taking the cave algorithm and building up a cave structure which doesn't look like a coating but actually the connectivity is similar to what we believe happens and what we see uh, in real coatings um, so it allows us to look at different things um, and you know what we can see is that that particle placing in 2D is so qualitatively correct and as I said we've had four MSc students who've had the misfortune to use this for their project and seem to have been you know, able to use it and um, hopefully it's been educational for them. Um, you know, looking forward, you'd think about, can we build coatings even more realistically? But bear in mind, this is 2D again. So you know, making the 2D however perfect it could be, it still won't be reality. Um, and then, you know, yeah, if I can find, if, if by making it open source, somebody really clever out there spots it and thinks there's something more useful to do with it, that's brilliant. Um, what do our coatings really look like? So this is a cross-section for a couple of coatings. And as you can see, these pigment particles are really pretty random. We put in a particular material that gets mixed with a solvent, gets mixed with a polymer. It goes through a high shear mixing process that will break up the particles. So even if we tried to put a particular type of particle in, the particle that's incorporated in the coating will look quite different. And these are two coatings at different stages of uh, milling and different magnification in this case where you can see different you know, size of the particles. So, right, what does cellular automata do? I mean, if you know all about it, so basically the whole point is it's cellular. So I decide that I have a grid of, of n by n squares. Each of those squares represents something. It can represent polymer, it can represent inhibitor, it can represent water, and that water can have dissolved inhibitor in it. And I've got to have rules for how those interact. So what I then say is I put my... Uh, but this is all inhibitor here, so I put my inhibitor here, I put water on top of it, and then the st statistics happen, well, probability happens. So I can set the probability that a cell will dissolve, I can set how much of that dissolves, to try and mimic reality. So here, that cell there reached the right level, and basically that water goes in, it dissolves it, and that then is able to diffuse. So that's the dissolution, and then diffusion, it's starting to move. Um, the rules you're setting, all of this is, is set up. So you're setting all these rules in here. The size of the cell is important. Um, but each cell only knows about the cells around it. So there isn't normally action at a distance with cellular automata. Otherwise, you lose the advantages. Because there is somebody who said, why don't you just do the blank, blank calculations? Well, because they take a long time. The reason they take a long time is because you've got all the mass behind it. Here, you've simplified it by saying this cell can only see the ones around it. So diffusion is happening by a random walk, not by a concentration gradient, because the cell doesn't know that what the concentration of any cells are, apart from the ones around it. Um, the box, you can decide where things are allowed to be lost from. Are you going to lose things from the top of the box? So basically when the inhibitor gets to an edge, are you going to let it then go if it's dissolved in water, or are you going to reflect it back again in some way? So all these typical things you can set to try and make the thing realistic. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other things you could think of doing here. You know, we're not having any, any transport through the, um, the polymer. In reality, we know there is some water transport through the polymer. Should we simulate that in this? We're not, because the bigger part of transport is through the pores. Similarly, I could simulate things like rusting. Someone could try and predict whether this has reached the critical concentration. But you've got to be careful in this sort of simulation that you won't necessarily learn anything from that because you've set the critical concentration. So all I'll get is the critical concentration back again. So I don't know, but as a teaching thing, that could still be useful. So if you've got the idea, you can then basically get, you know, this inhibitor cell here, there's a density ratio between the inhibitor and the solubility. So there's a certain amount of inhibitor in solid inhibitor. When that goes into solution, you can't dissolve one cell into one cell of water, or you can set it not to. You can say that it needs nine cells of water to dissolve one cell of inhibitor. And all of these things. So basically here we end up with this inhibitor, single cell of inhibitor here has ended up being all these sets, and that's able to diffuse and, and travel around. Okay, I think that's probably almost enough on the rules. I seem to have got a bit carried away here. Um, and as I said, you know, setting these, you can set your solubility. So basically you can't, if you reach the solubility limit, then you can't dissolve any more inhibitor into that cell of water. So all of these things will affect the way in which that simulation occurs. Um, so what I can set is density and solubility. I can then set the kinetics and that becomes slightly more tricky. So how likely is something to 
dissolve or not just how much dissolves but how likely so that will affect the kinetics rather than the, the level that actually happens um, do physical laws work well yes basically we get the sort of behavior you'd expect if you take cells of different size or circles of different sizes and you just let them um, dissolve you get the re response you'd expect in terms of a diffusion curve or a square root dependence on time so we simulated diffusion by random walk if you did this numerically, what you'd have is a concentration gradient rather than what you're seeing here, which is individual cells. But that you know, says there is some physical reality here. Um, so, OK, right. The structure we've got in here, um, there are many ways we can think of, to, of setting this up. You could take 2D cross sections and use those as your uh, mimics. Particle packing is the obvious one because you think about chucking these particles in. Um, equally, one could draw it. Um, and then program it with cellular automata, as I've said. And those are the two that are implemented, particle packing and cellular automata. How do we make our particles? We basically decide on a particle size, and then we go through and cut it. To try and get a random particle, all I'm doing is just cutting sections off to end up with a particle. And this is simulating the milling process. So when we take these particles and we put them through our high shear mills, bits are going to break off. So I'm just selling, milling that to end up with this um, particle I've got, got, got there. Depending on how many cuts you do, depends on how many shape. You can then say, well, that particle's too small, I'm going to throw it away. So you can set all sorts of things like particle size distribution. Chuck these particles in, basically. So you put them inside a box. Do they fit in? Are they colliding with anything else? If they're colliding, you can't put that particle in. You look, try a new location. And that way you reach a set, uh, what we call pigment volume concentration, so the amount of particles you have in that particular volume. And obviously here it should really be area. So you end up with a coating with some particles inside it. Dissolution happens, this particle is dissolved because it's connected through that small connection with the other particle. Otherwise this one here will never dissolve because it's never connected. So these are all rules you've set in here. Um, one of one of Floor's students, um, Charlie, has, has basically had a look at some of these and she's managed to generate basically percolation, which is once again something you'd expect. You know, if the particles aren't connected, you're going to get this low levels of release down here. Once particles start to be connected and you get towards percolation, then you have release as you'd expect. So, you know, it looks sensible. Not, not learning a great deal there. Similarly, the results I showed you from, well, that one appears wrong. Similarly, the results I showed you from uh, Reza, where he'd seen basically that different levels of PVC gives you different levels of release. Here it's, it's a bit more black and white, but basically high levels, we get high release and it continues for a long time, and we're seeing short times. The other thing is, is not only is, is space cellular, but time's also cellular. What I don't know and I need to calibrate is what that time step is. So this is all talking about steps. So we can see the PVC and you, know, you can see that by eye. You know, low concentration, not much connectivity, higher concentration, a bit more, very high concentration, everything dissolves. Um, the generative solution here was this um, idea here of where basically instead of that, we, we basically generate this sort of structure. So it doesn't look like a coating, but once again, it's but a poor path. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, can I predict what that leaching curve will look like just by looking at this graph or have I got to run the simulation? Um, so, right, what's the whole thing look like? So this is just running through for one small particle. This is what you'd see happening. So dissolves. It can only dissolve out of this hole here. So basically what you're seeing is that dissolution process happening, sort of as you'd expect it physically to happen. You know, it can't dissolve any of it there. And in the end, we will empty that. I think it's after about 70, or it gets to 90% release because life's too short. Um, and, you know, once again, one should repeat experiments, which is, um, yeah, Simon's first law of science, if you get a decent experimental result, don't repeat it. Um, you know, here, one very much has to do that. And, you know, you do see variation, but, you know, basically, and obviously for this thing, and once again, because it's quick, one should do lots of these. Stating the obvious outputs out of this, what I'm largely getting out is I get the structure. So I know what structure I've got. I'm getting out a series of leaching curves under a series of different conditions. I can then play with the parameters to see what uh, I've got there. So let's put lots of particles in. And you know, here we've got connectivity, so things are dissolving out quite nicely. And this is the sort of thing we can then build in complexity onto that to look at you know, what effect this has on the leaching. And in the end, this is critical for us making decisions 
about how we might design a coating or how you might design a coating. The same is obviously true for um, things like um, controlled release drugs. You once again need to get the release profile to give you the right level of drug. In our case, it's corrosion inhibitor. Um, uh, looking at different coatings, you're going to see a whole, you know, do we actually get the same results from similar coatings um, or do we, and why do we get the differences in release? Um, I'll click through all of these, I think, really looking at time. Um, what I wanted to come to was a couple of, and this is the sort of computer experiments you can do um, easily on a computer like this that would take people in the lab an awful lot of time to do. To repeat five coatings in the lab is, is a lot of work. To do this is obviously very quick. Now, the question is, you know, what the, and I think what, what I've said is out of this we're getting insights. So do small particles have a big effect? Does a poor structure of this sort the sort of thing we should be generating? So looking at a couple of specific examples. So here we've got inhibitors of very different levels of um, solubility. So the purple particles are very soluble. What you see is very rapid release of that particle particle. But as soon as you've got a, a yellow particle, it's blocking any further release. So you get this plateau here until that's released. Now what we see and what Reza saw in his results is in 3D, you don't see these plateaus in this way because it's averaged. So this slice may be doing you know, what I've shown here where we have a plateau, but the slice next to it would have been releasing a lot more there. And it's the cumulative level in 3D that would give us the release profile we're looking for. But the same principle still applies that you can control the rate of release and what's released by not just one species, but the interaction of all the species together. And so another example of a similar sort of system, and once again, the idea of repeating this, and these are very high levels of loading and actually high accessibilities in this case. And once again, you see, you know, release very rapidly of these purple particles, slowed down by the um, orange particles, and then you have a small amount of release because there's a small particle there and so on. So you get quite interesting effects of this here. Now you can make the system considerably more complicated. Um, so here's a system with four inhibitors in it. Um, and you know, as we actually see in some of the real coatings where you are using multiple inhibitors, you get different levels of release. Uh, what I'm not sure is if I click now, will it actually, did it start or did it? Yeah, no, right, sorry. Um, so you know, once again, you can track each of these, and this is a luxury that's more difficult to do experimentally. Um, another example of multiple inhibitors, um, just showing you how, you know, by varying, in this case, the solubilities of these materials um, by quite a large amount, um, it changes the way in which they behave. Um, so the status we're at is basically this, this simulation is, is, is available on GitHub. Um, anybody can play with it. Um, you can alter the code, you can clone it, uh, modify it. Um, you know, the, the implemented rules for inhibitors for the, um, an inert polymer for water and the dissolution of in, and, um, inhibitors and diffusion. Um, the coating binder, uh, the well, coating builder by random particle packing, um, and then this cellular automata way of building a poor network. And I think hopefully you've seen it demonstrates the effect that there's definitely an effect of not just the level of particles, but the way in which they're packed controls the release. And that's what we see happens in a 3D system in, in real life as well. Um, you know, what we've extend, what I've extended to recently is to deal with multiple inhibitors, um, to look at um, building the coatings by a number of different ways. MSC students have used it and really open source encourage you to do it. Next steps will be up on um, GitHub in due course when there are any next steps. Um, just wanted finally to acknowledge you know, that this has very much come out of the inspiration of the work we've been doing uh, both experimentally and modeling wise, um, previously with the work of Eugene Benetti and um, carried on with some of the work going on at the moment. Um, and really just to leave it with that, but um, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for your attention and uh, hope you've got some questions. Thank you, Simon. So these papers open for questions. How, in, in a real system, how close do you think you are to a collation threshold? Well, we, yeah, I mean, um, 
A, a true percolation of not. I mean, that, that would be the worst possible situation, a true percolation threshold. So when, when chair labor is getting up to those high levels, that would be a very bad coating because we'd probably generate a, you know, bear in mind we've got a top coat, so actually percolation isn't quite as bad as you'd expect because that's protecting. However, if you have a scribe here, you don't want to lose all the inhibitor. Um, so probably true percolation, bad idea. Local percolation, yes, we need it. I, I, I'm kind of motivated by the difference in 2D and 3D because you yeah. know, it's a critical phenomenon. I expect it's really much worse, closer to the threshold. You know, the, the, the dimensionality differences, I'd imagine, would be much more important actually on the threshold. So you may, if you're not at that threshold, then that might not be causing you so much trouble. Yeah, I, I think you're. I think you're right. Three, two, two, two D. I mean, it's 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 a sort of flatland story. If you've read, you know, obviously read flatland, but you know, it, it really isn't. But it's trying to Get those physical ideas at this particle size, you know, shape once again. Um, you know, it's not just a single measure of particle size. I've got five microns. So it's what the distribution is. It's what the shape is. Um, I think, yeah, you, I'd have to be very – to predict, you know, a per, per, perfect level for 3D from 2D would be wrong. To think what experiments we should be doing based on that 2D model would seem to be a reasonable thing to do. But you're right, percolation is a bit of a tricky one, certainly 2D. Thanks, Richard. Oh, thanks a lot, Simon. That was a great talk. Um, I just wanted to know, well, have you looked into the effects of what order you solve your cells in, if that has an effect? It does. So what I discovered was that the person whose code I copied basically had, well, he, he favoured downwards. I don't favour downwards. I, so the first thing I had to do was make it random. So it didn't just go down, left, right, you know, and so on. It went, woomph, woomph, depending. And, and you're right, that has an effect. I think in, in terms of yeah, the rules, um, a, as you set, I, I've done a lot of experiments with things like probabilities of one, densities of one, solubility of one, because they're quick ways of testing the code. Once you start to set high densities, so like a density of, you know, so basically you're saying that a particle's, density is 30 times its solubility, then that order becomes less important. Once you say that diffusion is not 100% and dissolution is not 100%, the chances of those flashing means the order you evaluate them is less important. And that's what some of the students have done is to stretch those a bit more. But you, yeah, the, the whole thing of set of rules is, is it's only as good as the rules. So any of those I've got wrong, I've, I'm simulating what I've simulated and that could be wrong. But that's something we need to think about. And I think you know, why we, your work with the you know, proper mathematics, um, I, I, haven't, I need to put your pore structure into my system and see what it looks like. And you know, whereas you will have a quantified time, I haven't got that. I've got time steps. And I can switch, switch it onto your curve by just you know, changing my timeline. But it doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything that we didn't know. Thanks, Joe. Um, Simon, what, um, doesn't the... Uh, the random walk kind of determined that it won't specifically go down. The random walk being if it can step that way or if it can step that way. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way he'd implemented silly altometer, no, because the first thing you tried was down. Right. So basically, because it was in a constrained cave, you didn't see it. He wasn't doing the experiment okay. where it was, a, I mean, it's a, a sort of, uh, and it, once again, if you had a probability that was reasonably low, then it wouldn't matter because, but he was right. testing down checking probability, and if the probability was one, he was, well, the probability was oh, above okay. the level, he was going down. So we're so not really using a random walk. He, he, he wasn't in a way, but he, it looked like it because his probability, you know, each you test down first, but it's unlikely to be true. You test the next one, yeah. it's equally unlikely. So you yeah. do, yeah. You, you get nearer to a random walk, and that simple, you know, it's only when you look at the code, hang on a second, you know, I can, I can protect the bottom, but it's not leaving from the top. It, you suddenly realize, because I liked it, because it was showing me in a scribe when I first did it, that I was building up inhibitor at the bottom of the scribe, which is just what I wanted. But, you know, showing it to other people, they weren't quite so convinced. And, you know, I, I then went back and looked at the code, and it's, you know, um, only as good as the code. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And what, what, what about the mesh size? Um, Does that govern your particle size? I, I, the, yes, I mean, the, the, you know, the resolution is obviously well, it's governed by the, the mesh size. 
and hence your minimum particle. So there's nowhere I will have to spread. You know, you start to lose the advantage of a cellular automata um, if you have too many active cells and if you're basically your resolution gets too fine. Because mm -hmm. I'm benefiting by the, the discretization of time and space. Yeah, and yeah. the more continuous, the you know, more I'm going to struggle. Yeah. 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 It seems fairly clear that you'd ideally like to use a 3D model. Um, have you considered using modern graphics processes because they're optimized for doing this sort of work? Um, I, I mean, to, I, I guess, yeah, you, to, to actually do the real work, yes, we want to use 3D. And yes, I, I don't know where we are. We've, we've, certainly we did discuss it. I don't know whether Eugenio got a chance to do it um, with his work or not. Um, you, you still, 3D, you, you still get an awful lot of calculations you need to do. Oh, yeah. Um, the other thing is actually the, the 2D stuff, it, 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 from an understanding point of view, it's easier to see what's happening. So part of the idea was to give people a quick rough and ready tool, they could just see what's happening, to stimulate you know, the experiment they were going to do, rather than give them the results and replace the experiment. But you're right, 3D is what we should be simulating. Yeah. I, mean, I think there is an argument that the main thing you learn from these are the questions you've got to ask. But still. Yeah, no, that, that's precisely, no, that was part of the idea. I mean, it, the motivation was, you know, I, I, I was frustrated the fact, or his other colleagues were frustrated the fact we couldn't use this on a daily basis. I oh. came across some way we could do something on a daily basis. Whether it was what we wanted to do in the first place, you sort of have to question. Well, I think you might find that, you know, a modern graphics card could give PC you, yeah, yeah. Would, would race through this sort of work. Yeah, I don't no. know. I've never tried to do it, but I have considered it because yeah. I worked on this sort of thing for metals with Roger Newman a long time ago, well, yeah. 30 years ago probably, but yeah. so I'm familiar with the problems. I'll challenge my colleagues or get edu educated more. So, yeah, thank, thank you, Bob. Great. Okay. Well, I, I guess this is the beginning of um, the introduction of a lecture by saying, can you all get your mobile phones out, please? Yeah.